restaurant business. Uh, to me means that uh, they used to take canaries into the mines, coal mines, and when the birds stopped singing, that was unsafe for the, the workers to be put in there. For myself, I feel that uh, I spent 40 years working in the industry, and uh, now I'm coming out to die. My name is Heather Crow. I'm 57 years old, and I'm dying of lung cancer from secondhand smoke. I found that the restaurant industry was a, a good place for me to be because it was the hours were available, and I, and I was a single parent, so I could put my family life together as well as my work schedule. In a very busy restaurant or, or a pub, and uh, the smoke in the, in the actual restaurant or, or bar was generally, the, the air was blue. That it's, it's a smoker's tumor was in my lung. I've never smoked a day in my life. I've been exposed for 40 years to secondhand smoke from the restaurant industry. That's a beat off the girls, right? That's right. <laughs> We are here to celebrate the birthday of Heather Crow, who is with us today. And Heather's uh, 61 today, and we uh, think that's a great achievement. Heather Crow came to see Cynthia Callard and I in the summer of 2002 and said that she wanted to help. She had lung cancer, yet she wanted to help others. Uh, and help she has. Here we are four years later. When we started our work with Heather in 2002, barely 5% of Canadians lived in jurisdictions where there was protection from secondhand smoke in the workplace and public places. With the new laws in Ontario and Quebec, and later this year in, in Nova Scotia, Heather's home province, by the end of this year, 80% of Canadians will live in such jurisdictions. <laughs> that phenomenal change in just a few years is due mostly to the efforts of Heather Crow. Halifax area was really dense, and uh, but we used to go play in the woods all the time and make forts and stuff like that. And, uh, so that didn't scare us. It was not a part of our. We had no fear, you know. And so my mother told us that it's not it's not uh, the animals you have to be afraid of. It's the people, you know. So she was native, and I, you know, they would have taken the children, all of them, away as soon as they were four years old. They had no rights. To bring them up, and uh, they wanted to uh, to eliminate uh, the culture totally. She married a white man, and by doing so, that gave us the protection. I left when I was 17, and uh, I came up here to, to work, and I landed in I guess it was 1962 in Toronto, and uh, and there was no no more than four stories high in Halifax at that time. So you can imagine here I'm coming, I was just blown away. I was amazed by the size of uh, the, the, the train station and everything. But I found that my first day out uh, in Toronto, I had a job. And then they came to me and said, can you do a banquet? I said, what's a banquet? And they said, well, come with us and we'll show you. So uh, after that, they were always after me to do banquets. So I work all day and then do a banquet at night for two hours or so. I looked at things that I wanted and wanted to do, and uh, nobody had ever told me I can't be 
a good single parent or I can't buy my own house and whatever. So I did just that, you know. And, uh, if I didn't make twenty dollars that day, or if I only made twenty dollars, it was it was at least twenty dollars more than I had when I went to work that morning. So that's the way I looked at things, you know. I still had a chance to earn a decent living because all I had to do was try a little harder. It was like writing my own paycheck. And Mo was Mo gave me the tables to do that, and all I had to do was work them to my advantage, which was to take care of my customers. You really look after your customers and you think of them as, you know, it's an honor to serve them. In the summertime, we always have problems to find staff, lots of holidays, people to go away. And she came to me and she said to me, uh, Mo, uh, I wonder how you are doing with the holidays. In my heart, I'm thinking, I hope to God she's not going to ask for some holidays now because I'm stuck, I'm short staff. And I couldn't say no to her because she never really put me on a spot where she asked for something uh, if I'm stuck. So I said to her, why Heather? She said to me, because I just came back from the doctor and uh, he told me that I have cancer and I don't want to leave you stuck. Um, I couldn't believe my ears when she said that. She was worried about me, how I'll be stuck with my staff. She was not so much concerned about her having the cancer. But that's how Heather is. I had a good lifestyle and, um, and I figured my health was pretty good. and. Uh, then I had a couple of lumps on the side of my neck, and I thought, well, it's an ear infection, a throat infection. Three weeks went by and nothing, and then I went to the doctor and I said, what are these, you know? Uh, took some blood work and sent me for a chest x-ray. The very next day, the chest x-ray came back, and there was a tumor the size of my hand and my lung. I, I was blown away. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Uh, it was like, how can I possibly have... I never smoked a day in my life. Uh, you sure it's not tuberculosis? And she told me, no, it's cancer. It's a large cancerous tumor. Well, cancer absorbs your whole life. You live for the cancer on a day-to-day -day basis. Your appointments, your chemo, your pills, mountains of pills, you're concerned about you run fever and uh, high blood pressure, and you don't know how many pills you have a hard time with medication because the chemo gets into your brain, get all confused. It's one problem I just couldn't deal with. I, I have a process of dealing with problems and there was just no formula for this one. I had to uh, go through it and I have to do the journey. And I remember listening, and she said that she wanted to become an advocate, she wanted to get involved. And I thought, hmm, this woman's about to start cancer therapy. Uh, I don't really know about this. So we struck a bargain. Uh, Carol McDonald, one of our health, public health nurses, was, was with us. And I remember saying to Heather that this, uh, this might be a wild horse, um, this advocacy piece, especially um, given how sick you are and the treatments you, you're going to need. Carol would help her with her treatments and accompanied her to her treatments. And even when Carol was away, we had someone else substitute for her. And in that way, we became very involved. When, when I would pick her up, she'd be nervous, and I'd be nervous. Can I support her in the way that she needs to be supported? And of course, as you know, you don't just whip into a, um, an appointment and you're out in half an hour. It, normally they take about three hours. Without exception, Heather and I would always end up laughing in the, in the room and when the doctor would come in we'd be laughing because she, she just took it in her stride. I got a phone call from a woman who said, um, is this Cynthia Callard? And I said yes. And she said, I want to talk to you because I'm dying from secondhand smoke caused cancer and I need you to help me for workman's compensation claim. She came into my office and she asked that uh, she was applying to workers' compensation and she wanted letters signed um, 
She asked me if I would help her get letters signed by pretty much every politician, municipal, provincial, and federal within 100 miles. Her workers' compensation board claim, her successful claim, also made her a public persona instantly with national news coverage and established her credibility on this issue of secondhand smoke because she it allowed her to tell anyone, any politician, any journalist, that uh, there's no question that her lung cancer is caused by secondhand smoke. I was in the habit of uh, uh, having breakfast daily at the Newport. Uh, Heather was the uh, was the, the server there. One day uh, she asked me how I was and I said fine in typical fashion and then I asked her how she was and it seemed that the dam just kind of burst at that point and she explained to me that uh, she just received the uh, test results uh, for herself and that she'd been diagnosed with uh, with lung cancer. So I explained to her that we were in the process of developing a campaign on secondhand smoke. I've been a waitress for 40 years to earn a decent living for, for my daughter and myself. My doctor told me I had a smoker's tumor and therefore uh, I'm dying. I never smoked a day in my life. And uh, it's been said that the stars aligned and Heather was a star for us and uh, the things have kept moving and the provinces have come on board and so forth. It's been incredible since 2002 to 2006 what Heather has probably been behind. Heather by re removed the barriers and by removing the barriers she changed the way we do our business and that allowed the whole world to change because it really was Heather's story that united people in understanding that this was work that had to be done. And, and she has that ability to just mm -hmm. find those very colorful, very simple images that really resonate with people. My retirement plans, um, I, after 40 years most people are taking their retirement check and uh, downsizing in their homes and uh, planning a nice retirement. With me, uh, after 40 years, I, am, uh, I have to retire due to the fact that I have lung cancer from secondhand smoke. And I, I, I'm planning my uh, funeral. And I'm, I'm downsizing into a urn. And I looked at the le legislation, the protection for us, the worker, in the hotel restaurant industry. There's absolutely no provisions for us. We seem to be the invisible worker, or are we the disposable worker? When Heather and I began our visits across Canada to visit labor ministers, health ministers, uh, municipal politicians, and community groups all across the country, we weren't sure what was uh, going to turn out. But we knew one of our very early visits was going to be a major test. One of our very first visits was to uh, Iqaluit in Nunavut territory. Hi, nice to meet you. Very nice to be here. Thank you for your time on this very important subject. Jack Anwa. Very nice Whatever. to meet you. Jack, how are you? Very good. Thank welcome, you. welcome to Nunavut. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm very pleased to be here. To meet you, Rebecca. Nice to meet you. Rebecca is a mother and a member of the Legislative Assembly. She represents the uh, highest Arctic communities in, in Nunavut, the farthest north communities. Mm -hmm. That's great. So you come to talk to us about mm -hmm. we should not be smoking. Uh, to get some changes. Mm -hmm. Good. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting us. Um, it's, been, it's been a very nice trip up this way and my first time. And I'd like to share my story with you. Um, I've been a waitress for 40 years in the hotel restaurant industry. And uh, in March of 2001, 2002, I was diagnosed with lung cancer. I've never smoked a day in my life. And through the 40 years of exposure, I've received the lung cancer. Uh, there was absolutely uh, no um, symptoms of this disease, and I have, uh, I'm a third stage lung cancer, so it's, it's very advanced. My mother was Mi'kmaq Indian, so um, as, as I, uh, I uh, look upon that as, as myself being an elder, and therefore I uh, also look towards our children are our future, 
and that we need to bring this forward to protect them. White face, but a red heart. Mona, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And this young man, Robbie. Nice to meet you, Robbie. Thank you for coming. Thanks for your time, eh? It's important to me. And make sure you guys don't uh, smoke, or at least if you do, to uh, have some information. Trying to quit. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got lots who are trying to quit. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's a, that's a beginning. Yeah. Can I say? Hi? There was absolutely no, uh, when I got sick, there was absolutely no doubt that I would do this, that I had to make it public awareness, that I had to bring, be speaking to people that I worked with, uh, the people that I, I spoke to didn't know that uh, secondhand smoke kills, they weren't aware of it, so therefore I had to get the message out across Canada and to get the politicians to change the labor laws and, and uh, to amend legislation, and this is why I'm out trying to do the best. If I don't try, we'll never know. On the right hand side. Okay, thank you. And the door's solid, you can hold on to that. As a result of Heather's visit, the very first provincial or territorial jurisdictions to go smoke-free in Canada were in fact Nunavut and the Northwest Territories. Yes, I still want to be public. And the reason is because uh, I just feel so strong about this that people need to know, people need to watch, people need to be aware. And it's not fair for the non smoker who has to pick up all the slack. And the, the kids that we've seen at the schools, uh, you know, when Heather speaks, you can hear a pin drop. And, and that's a real gift because I. The kids also recognize that Heather tells the truth. I, I don't want to stand behind the kids, and I don't stand in front of them giving them instructions. But I'll stand beside them and see what they can do. Today, in representation of our commitment and passion to expose the truth about tobacco, we have made close to 1,000 paper cranes to thank you, Heather, for inspiring us every day to fight to the finish. It is our hope that all of the desires in your heart come true. We are your ambassadors. So this is the actual ribbon with your initials on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna, our goal is to sell 47,000 of oh, these ribbons. Gosh. We will. All the way across the province. Oh, and there'll be students all across Ontario buying ribbons to support mm -hmm. everything that you've done and thank you for everything mm -hmm. that you've done for us. So this is gonna go in a little promotional package to students across the province mm -hmm. to put up so that mm -hmm. everybody will know what's going on with the campaign. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are the hands of youth. Okay. Yeah. Supporting, like reaching for the ribbons to support. Mm -hmm. and, and the bird is so that we carry your message of hope across the province. Right. Wow. Message of
sure the message is because the, the message is valuable, but because she's also an outstanding person, and people don't feel threatened uh, by her, but they understand um, what she's talking about. But what's really remarkable is that Heather was better at this business. She was mm -hmm. better at advocacy, and she was better at public health than any of us. And that's what we've witnessed over the past four years. Perhaps. I know perhaps someone else could have come into our lives as we we're all kind of ready for this story. I don't think, I think the chance of someone else who would have been able to do it is, is, is severely slim. I don't think there are many, there are, there are about a thousand people a year, I'm told, from the statistics, who suffer Heather's fate. I don't think there's one in a million people that are like Heather who would have been able to take that and do something with it. This has been a, a labor of love. Everybody was there as soon as I was wanting to do something, you know, to, uh, to make a difference. It's, it's, it's still not over yet. And um, as they say, until the fat woman sings, but uh, I'm getting skinnier all the time. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank you for coming and uh, enjoy. And I hope you uh, have a good time tonight. Different, definitely, one person can make a difference. Definitely. You have to stand up and believe in what you believe in and deliver, no matter what they tell you. So this is the way, I, why I went that way.